Hello and welcome to our special program To The Point. Today we have with us Justice Jagdish Sharan Verma, former Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of India and also the man who was given the task of going ahead and suggesting changes to the existing criminal law for protecting women, for providing better safety and security to women in the aftermath of that horrific event of gang rape in the national capital in December last year. So, welcome to our show. Thank you. Uh, you have just submitted your report. It has not been long. Uh, and uh, several recommendations you have made uh, with respect to uh, making uh, you know, changes in the existing law. Also, uh, with respect to how uh, uh, the police forces should act. And interestingly, some changes with respect to the People's Representation Act as well. First and foremost is that the time frame which was given to your committee was just 30 days. And uh, if I'm not wrong, uh, the suggestions which came from uh, the public as well as uh, uh, the organizations uh, and NGOs and uh, women, uh, women's rights organizations were almost around 80,000. Yes. How yes. did your team manage to go ahead and ensure compile a report of 630 pages out of that 80,000 suggestions? As a matter of fact, a group of young people, young lawyers, law graduates, the students, all volunteers, you see, they work together round the clock for all this time and I would like to give the maximum credit to them. The, each one of those recommendations or responses which had come was read by this team and the important ones were placed before us. They had culled out what were the common recommendations which of course were not labeled under too many heads. So every one of them was read, nothing was ignored. And well, it was the dedication of everyone in the team and uh, both my colleagues, the members and the entire team which made it possible, which only goes to show if you are committed to the task, you can certainly do it. Committed to the task, certainly uh, it can be performed. Uh, coming to recommendations and the most important of that because uh, uh, till the time uh, Justice Verma Committee was uh, in the process of compiling its uh, uh, you know, uh, recommendations and going through all these suggestions, uh, there was uh, a clamor in uh, uh, the media as well as uh, there were suggestions coming in from several quarters for a death penalty to the rapists. Your committee has not gone ahead and recommended a death penalty. Rather, it has uh, suggested an enhancement of uh, imprisonment, the term of imprisonment for those uh, who commit this heinous crime. Why so? Because the overwhelming response and the view was that death penalty is not desirable, it will not serve the purpose, and death penalty does not reduce the percentage of uh, uh, convictions. And, uh, even the women's group leaders who have been working in the field for decades, they were unanimous that there should be no death penalty. But then uh, uh, one of the committee members uh, has already gone on record saying that uh, all three of you, there were three members including you, all three of you were of the viewpoint to a certain extent that this can be considered. But finally, in the report, it did not happen. Rather, the committee went ahead and, as I was saying earlier, uh, recommended that the term of imprisonment should be increased instead of uh, you know, uh, uh, giving a death penalty to uh, the rapist. The mere fact that we kept deliberating on the issue till almost the end goes to show the amount of care which was bestowed by the committee in reaching its conclusion. And finally, after taking into account all the pros and cons, the statistics, the empirical study on the subject, and particularly also the current trend where there is a strong view for abolition of death penalty, even where it is provided for offenses, we also took into account the factor, should we add one more offense to that list when the modern trend is for abolition of death penalty. Therefore, we thought that the alternative sentence of life, meaning whole of the remaining life, was probably more desirable and acceptable in keeping with the modern trend and also in keeping with the overwhelming opinion. But uh, you're a former Chief Justice of the Supreme Court yourself and we've seen in many cases uh, uh, the death penalty being handed over by the courts uh, clearly says that it is a rarest of the rare crime. Isn't uh, the, the, this particular incident if, uh, you know, after which this committee was formed, specifically the daily gang rape case, wasn't that rarest of rare crime? 
it is like this. We were not pronouncing on a particular case. And a gen law is made for general application, not for a particular case. And it is well said that hard cases make bad law. So we were not to be influenced by the facts of this case or prejudge the issue. You see, we were supposed to re make, a re make rec our recommendations in general what the law ought to be. Therefore, you see, and as a judge uh, uh, for a long time, and so also Justice Leela said, well, we have been trained all along not to be influenced by extraneous factors. So, not not so to be influenced, that's why... By extraneous factors. By extraneous factors. That's why this was basically a recommendation in general sense, not to a particular specific case. Uh, one, one very interesting uh, thing which I was uh, reading when I was going through your uh, report was that uh, there are several other offenses uh, which you have touched upon uh, in this in this particular report, uh, and and uh, you know you have you have gone ahead and uh, uh, pointed out that there are several other offenses such as eve teasing, uh, voyeurism, stalking, as well as sexual assault and unsolicited uh, sexual assault. So you're basically uh, 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 pointing out several more uh, uh, you know forms of uh, sexual assault or uh, you know sexual offenses which should be uh, brought under the purview of the law and should uh, separate uh, recommendations were made for them. I'll just add one thing to the previous question of yours before I come to this. In cases of rape which also end in death, see in addition to the offense of rape, the offense of murder is also committed and that attracts section 302 which already provides for death penalty. So there is no reason, no occasion to provide that in 376 in that case also. Now coming to this. You see, the ultimate offense of rape, it, that's not the starting point, that's the end point. It is, starts with the street Romeos, Eve teasing, as was the, you see, um, for, uh, expression used earlier, which of course we have used different expressions. These minor sexual offenses graduate into the ultimate aggravated sexual assault. And therefore, you see, we have also focused on prevention of these offences, not merely on, you see, curing the malady that is by catching the perpetrator and punishing him after the crime is committed. It is always much better to prevent a crime rather than to punish a crime after it happens. Now, these are the preventive measures. If you see, no rapist does it for the first time. The history of each one of them would show that he began with the smaller things. If he had been stopped there, he would not have graduated to in crime to reach that level. Maybe maybe began with Eve teasing, yes, stalking yes, or something yes. like that. Yes. Uh, we, we, we'll, we'll come back. We'll take a short break out here and when we come back, we'll talk about uh, the second most important part of uh, uh, Justice Verma's committee's recommendations. That is uh, to deliberate as to why are the age uh, limit for uh, considering a victim or uh, considering an offender a juvenile should not be brought down welcome back justice verma is still with us uh, sir second most important recommendation uh, with regards to the uh, you know public sentiment if i may put it that way is not uh, bringing down the age limit for an offender to be uh, considered a juvenile and that was one of uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the demands being made by the protesters throughout uh, this entire uh, you know, uh, uh, series of protests which went on after that horrific incident in the national capital. And uh, uh, incidentally, one of uh, uh, the uh, accused in that particular case is a juvenile himself. As I said, we'll keep this facts of a particular case apart. The empirical studies, the experts in the field who have been working for quite some time in the sphere of juvenile justicing, they were of that opinion based on data which was produced before us that it, it is not advisable to reduce the age from 18 to 16 in our conditions. For example, we have to take into account the environment in which the child grows. That is why we went into the area of trafficking also. Now trafficking of women and children a child who has been trafficked and subjected to sexual abuse and all other kinds of torture. Now, that person, that environment, 
for which the civil society is responsible. <coughs> then secondly, the protection homes, the juvenile homes, etc., the kind of management we have, they are further subjected to torture, abuse, etc. there. Now, the civil society also has a responsibility to discharge unless we take care of that aspect also and produce a proper environment for the growth of the child. It is not correct to think of a child at the age of 16 who has grown up in normal circumstances because when we are dealing with juvenile offenders, they are persons who invariably have not grown up in the normal circumstances, they have grown up in exceptional circumstances. And therefore, taking into account all these factors coupled once again with the study of persons who have been working in this field for long. Now, for example, one Professor Ved Kumari, she has been working in this field for quite some time. She produced the statistics. She also indicated the percentage of persons in that age group. As I said, we are not to be bogged down by a particular incident that in a particular case, a brutal offender was below 18. We have to see what is the general trend. So when you make a law, you have to take into account all these factors. But we have taken care of one thing, to prevent, you see, the hardship to children between age of 16 and 18, when there is consens uh, consensual sexual relationship, which is not an offense, to protect those children or those semi-adults or whatever you may choose to call, from being harassed or punished by the family or by the police. Because the kind of police uh, culture that we have seen, less said about it, the better. Exactly. That's what, because your report uh, has, has uh, made a lot of, uh, you know, uh, uh, scathing comments on uh, yes. the, the, the state of affairs in uh, yes. the police force, the, the way in which the police force goes ahead and performs its functions. Uh, specifically, you've, you've spoken about uh, child trafficking, drug yes, trafficking yes, and, uh, and several other offences yes. in which uh, police uh, force seems to be uh, a, a willing partner. Now, now what seems to be the solution out here? Because they're supposed to be the guardians of the law. They're supposed to be implementing the law which you are suggesting. That, that is why we have gone into the area of police reforms also. I mean, it's not the first time that we have said it. Starting with the National Police Commissions, first headed by Dharamveer, that distinguished bureaucrat, other commissions. Then Vinit Narayan, the well-known Hawala case, which I wrote the judgment. Yeah, yeah. There also, apart from CBI, I mentioned this. More recently, in 2006, Supreme Court directions in Prakash Singh's, Prakash case. Singh's case. Now, all that is to ensure the kind of police force which is protector of the society, not its persecutor. Today, one of the major grievances which everyone voiced was, FIRs are not registered. After a rape is committed, the victim wants to lodge an FIR. Not only is the FIR not registered, the victim or survivor is subjected to greater humiliation you find rapes being committed in custody. That's why we have dealt with that aspect also. Now, therefore, that was the reason that we had to go. Now, when you are wanting to make stricter laws, you have to also reform the police so that the law enforcement agency should be a credible agency. Otherwise, what you do is an incredible, inefficient, complicit, person, if you give him greater power, what is he going to do? You, you've also spoken about, uh, you know, uh, in, in your report of, of giving uh, powers to, uh, certain powers to, uh, limited certain powers to vigilantes, you know, uh, uh, people, uh, uh, local gentry of, of, of responsible people. Uh, do you think that's, uh, uh, that's, that's going to be a fair idea given the fact that we have uh, an established set of uh, uh, police forces and other uh, you know, mechanism to deal with the law and order? Well, having already spoken about the work culture of the established police force, today most of the people in the country, and I've never had any doubt, majority in the country are peaceful, peace-loving people, they are law-abiding, 
and they are a frustrated lot today, but they can do nothing. This idea of community policing, which I have had for a very long time, actually the first time I suggested this was to the present Lieutenant Governor of Delhi, who was then also the Lieutenant Governor when I was Chief Justice of India in 1997. I said, have this kind of community policing by choosing eminent people, respectable people from each locality and designate them as special magistrates under Section 21 of the Code of Criminal Procedure. Now, their presence alone will first of all instill some degree of discipline in the established police force because they would know that there is someone watching them all the time. You see, traffic violations, minor offences, they could be invested with power and round the clock, you see, they could supply this additional support to the existing police force and thereby also monitoring. The, you see, in a democracy, people's participatory role in governance is essential. That's an incident of a democratic polity. It's and for this the people, is a, by the people, yes. of the people. And therefore, you empower the people. Today, every, every person like, who is like-minded, and most of them are, they are frustrated, they can't do anything. Then you empower them in this manner, and there's always the excuse of inadequacy of police force which is talked of. This is one way of supplementing that. And it will have a cascading effect of improving the bird culture, even of the existing police. Supposing, you see, at every crossroad, every chorahar, roundabout, there is one eminent person invested with this power as a special magistrate uh, sitting. Now, during peak hours, you can have more than one, otherwise one. Chosen from, you see, the same locality. They can conveniently divide the time. His presence alone will ensure that the traffic policeman does his job and does not, and no truck wala, you see, I mean, pays him a bribe by, without, by lowering just the speed. We'll keep an, we'll keep an effective check, on, effective on, check. On, on the way and the entire And, and uh, the traffic violations which occur. And the street Romeos know that they will, they can be punished there itself. Definitely, definitely. Thank it will have some sort of impact. Yes. Uh, that's what uh, the suggestion seems to be. We'll take a short break out here and when we come back, we'll talk about another very interesting recommendation made by Justice Verma Committee and that pertains to People's Representation Act. Welcome back. Let's talk about uh, another recommendation and very important one on that uh, made by your committee. People's Representation Act. Uh, which deals with uh, uh, how our representatives uh, are being uh, chosen and you know what should be the qualification criteria for them, how the entire process should be governed. You made some recommendations with respect to that act as well. But some say that this was not the brief of Justice Verma Committee. It is like this. The foundation of our entire exercise is the focus on gender equality and overall gender justice, so that the women have the constitutional guarantee of equality under the, uh, all the laws and in every place. Now, if that is to be a reality, then the laws also must be of that kind and they must have safe spaces, not only of work, safe environment everywhere they go, so that they are equal partners and there is no occasion to say that a woman can't go to such and such place where a man can because it is insecure. They should be all secure places. Now, making the laws is a legislative function. Now, unless the legislators are sensitized to gender justice and they believe in that, how do you expect laws serving the cause of gender justice? and ensuring the gender equality, which is a con constitutional guarantee. That apart, look at the practical aspect. You see, we have recommended, for example, persons with criminal antecedents should not be... Should not be. See, not only political parties should not set them up as candidates, but that should be a disqualification. Now, if there is a person with a criminal antecedent background or a criminal, you see, as a candidate in the election for a, the area, you see, so far the election is concerned, 
women are inhibited from exercising their political right to vote and instances are not wanting that women refrain from voting just because the environment is not safe. No. Now, you see, and is there any dearth of persons who are the right kind in this country? There are plenty. For every such person, you will get half a dozen other persons, at least, uh, who are the right kind. So this is also, we have gone into this question because this also impacts on the right to equality of the women if you have to have it and because it is not merely the sexual part that's the that's just one aspect it is the constitutional foundation of right to equality of the women which really was the focus so, so basically we had a focus on uh, yes. uh, you know ensuring that uh, the right to equality the constitutional fundamental right to in, equality in, of in women every, is upheld in every way in every way and all these uh, uh, people who are uh, uh, you know at the end of the day entrusted with the task of making laws for the nation as a whole should be uh, worthy enough to go ahead and make those laws is that, that what your committee that, is trying to say that, that 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 is one aspect but before you see before they qualify for that you see the environment should be safe for the women to exercise that their political right to vote and also the other aspect because such persons ultimately control the lives of the women okay. and deny them the right to equality okay coming to coming to one more aspect of uh, your uh, uh, you know recommendations of your committee is uh, when you suggested that uh, in case of uh, uh, forces be it uh, uh, police forces specifically in case of armed forces uh, if at all a junior goes ahead and commits a sexual offense mm. the senior is liable to be punished with seven years to ten years of imprisonment now how does that work on what basis have has the committee uh, i'll uh, answer that. that there's a caveat we have not said that for every such offense committed by a subordinate the superior or commanding officer is responsible the superior officer is responsible when he had knowledge and the opportunity to prevent because we have focused also on prevention of crimes and he does not act for which is his duty if he is guilty of any act or omission which facilitates the commission of the crime he turns a blind eye he knows for example there is an exclusive camp to give an extreme example now you see that is out of bounds and and he finds and, and he has knowledge and it it is known to him that women are brought there by the jawans i mean is he not responsible for seeing that this thing doesn't happen or in a particular case if he knows that the people under him are committing this thing he does nothing to stop it so we have said only in those cases we have not said that if, you see someone said that if a man goes to his village and commits rape now well he has to read the law that we, he again, has to read the recommendation again again happen. it's not generalized it is, it is based on it's, it's no, for specific cases specific is, instances it is in those situations where his duty to act is attracted as as a superior as a superior he fails to perform yes, his duty yes, yes. as a superior yes. there in this particular recommendation of your committee I, should I, apply one very interesting uh, uh, point which i want to uh, ask you out here is that there were in addition to demand for a death penalty for the rapists there was also a demand of chemical castration that is something which does not seem to have been uh, you know uh, uh, given a go ahead by your committee why is that so that is so because of several reasons you see in the present human rights emerging human rights jurisprudence and culture and also according to the international instruments of human rights that is international human rights law you cannot you see inflict any pain or do anything to the body of someone without his consent and and this amounts to this is something which is forbidden by the human rights jurisprudence and then you see there are several other complications in the performance of this exercise so in the first place 
it is something which would be unconstitutional. And because you can't interfere with the bodily integrity, even of a you must, you must be aware of the debate, even where death sentence is permitted. Well, you see, it is not every form of killing. I mean, there also there is a debate what form of, you see, execution of death sentence should be there. This itself is a strong reason. And then the practical difficulties thereof, because we saw the literature on the subject, what is the thought globally, because we got responses from all over the world. You see, eminent professors from Harvard, Cambridge, this, that, judges from other countries and everywhere. Now, see, so taking into account all of this, it did not appear to be, in the first place, it would be unconstitutional. Secondly, it is something which is contrary, for that reason, also to the international human rights law. Then there is also the feasibility of ensuring. And if I may add, you see, one more factor, ancillary factor. These days when we are trying to fight with corruption all round, well, one doesn't know. Even this may be another route to corruption. So ultimately, someone else will have to certify. Someone that else has to certify. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time, sir. Thank you. Thank you for being with Rajya Sabha TV. So this was uh, Justice Jagdish Sharan Vama, whose committee's recommendation have already been submitted to the government on bringing in changes in the, in, uh, in, the, in the present system of criminal law to go ahead and provide better safety and security to women. We'll come back next week with a different issue and a different personality. Till then, keep watching Rajya Sabha Television.